Hi, I'm Kathy Smith and welcome to On Health, The Art of Living, where I bring you the latest information on how to live a healthier, more vibrant, more passion-driven life. Today's show, facial fitness. Okay, when you think of names of women who have seemingly defied the aging process, who comes to mind? For me, it's Helen Mirren, Kate Blanchett, Judy Dench, and these are just a few of the women who have decided to celebrate their natural beauty. So we admire them for their confidence, talents, and sense of style. But in a culture that's obsessed with youth, it can be difficult to embrace the aging process and be proud of the skin that you're in. So I'm frequently asked the question, is there something I can do to keep the tone and contour in my face the same way that I do with my body, but without having to have cosmetic procedures? So many are looking for alternatives to non-invasive approaches to maintain that more youthful look. So today's guest is Dr. Naima Ruffin, who's also known as the face fitness doctor. Now, Naima is an assistant clinical, assistant clinical professor at Mount Sinai Hospital, and she's the CEO and founder of Balance, which specializes in personalized face fitness with an expansive range of exercises tailored to tone the facial muscles and to create that youthful and symmetrical face and that facial appearance. She also has um, a clinical skincare line that's formulated with plant-based natural and organic ingredients to repair, to restore, and revitalize the skin. So in today's conversation, which I'm really excited about, we're gonna talk about specific facial exercises to lift and tighten certain areas of your face that maybe have decreased muscle tone over time. Now there's evidence-based research behind all this that supports that facial exercise is a natural facial way of rejuvenating the muscles in addition to cor correcting some facial symmetry. And um, it might be interesting, I'm interested to hear some of the studies that are even done with people that have Bell's palsy. So we're gonna talk also about facial expressions and that grimacing or that stress or whatever you might be holding could be causing and doing some things to your face that you don't want. And um, how do we break those habits? Easier said than done, right? Well, let me stop talking and welcome Naima to the show. She's lovely, she's out of New York and I uh, can't wait to get started. So welcome Naima. Thank you so much, Kathy. I'm so excited to be here to talk to you today about what I'm very passionate about. Well, let's start with that, because that was going to be one of my first questions. I mean, I love your background. You're very talented. You've studied in a lot of different disciplines. How did this passion for face fitness, skin, facial exercises, how did this come about? Where did it come about? And when did it come about? Uh, great question. Uh, so I would say I think I've always had a passion for skincare. Even back when I was nine years old, I would, you know, stand in front of the bathroom while my mom was getting ready for work. And, you know, I would just watch her, you know, putting on all her lotions and potions. And, you know, at the time, I would dip into some of her, cause her some of her, in, um, uh, products. And so what I, you know, eventually my mom would say, you know what, she just dragged me to the grocery store and she said, you need to pick out your own products because I'm tired of you digging into my clinic. So uh, I started with uh, St. Ives. I'm not sure if you remember the St. Ives apricot facial scrub and mud mask. And so I would have my own skincare routine. And, you know, I couldn't wait till I could have my own money to buy my own products. And I tried so many different products over the years. Um, but it was when I had turned uh, 48. And I remember looking in the mirror and I said to myself, wow, I just look so tired. I couldn't figure out, you know, even though I had gotten eight hours of sleep the night before, I couldn't figure out why I look tired, why my cheeks just look so deflated. And it was at that moment that I realized, wow, is this the aging process that just sort of sweeps over you? And then it's like downhill from there. And so I just wasn't satisfied with just sort of saying, well, that's it, you know, it's the aging process and just sort of letting things go. And so what I did was I started to do some research around the aging process. Now being, um, having, you know, spent four years in a surgical residency, 
I spent a lot of time on plastic surgery, uh, rotations, dermatology rotations. And so I, you know, I know what the facial muscles look like. I know the procedures. And one of the, the key themes throughout all of those types of procedures, whether it was Botox or surgery, was that it all involved the facial muscles. And so I'm saying to myself, you know, it's, it's got to be more than just the skincare products because I've been using great skincare products since I was, you know, a preteen. And so how is it that my skincare products have just sort of failed me in this process? And so when I started, you know, looking into the scientific and medical literature, that's when I realized that there there's more to it than just the skin. It has a lot to do with the facial muscles. And that for me was sort of like staring me right in the face. I mean, literally was the low hanging fruit for an anti-aging routine um, was really looking at the facial muscles and understanding their muscles, just like the rest of the muscles in your body. And we exercise those muscles because we see things looking loose and, and, you know, sort of, um, wrinkly. And so, uh, we turn that around by getting and hitting the gym and working out and, you know, doing all types of activities. Why couldn't we do something like that with the face? And so that's sort of what brought me to the epiphany of, wow, the facial muscles really play a large role in, uh, facial aging. So give us a quick anatomy lesson about the facial muscles. Um, how many, where they are, and which ones, which ones can you actually target, perhaps all of them, and which ones are more difficult to hit? That's a great question. So uh, there are over 50 muscles in the face and the neck, um, and it varies. So I say over because, you know, uh, everyone's different. Some people have a few uh, muscles that are different than others or situated differently, but I like to say there are over 50 muscles in the face and the neck. And the muscles are different in the face than they are in the rest of the body in that they're attached directly to the structures of the skin. So that is what makes working out the face so much more powerful than actually working out the rest of the body. Because one, the facial muscles, because they're attached directly to the skin, wherever the muscles go, the face, the, the skin goes. Um, and so there are various muscles in the cheeks, forehead, the mouth area, and so forth. And so when I, when you ask the question about uh, which muscles are sort of easier to target versus others, it, that's a great question because there's some muscles that are less complex than uh, others. So for example, the muscles that are less complex are the muscles around the eyes because those are pretty much a ring muscle and they operate like this. The mouth, it's the same thing, also another you know, ring muscle. So those are easier to target. When you look at the face, the aging face, what shows the sign of uh, aging first is are the eyes. The eyes is usually when you can tell, you know, someone's age. Um, and so targeting the eyes, because the skin around the eyes is so thin and very superficial, you get to work that muscle and see results much faster. So I usually say, within four to six weeks, you can see results around the eyes um, and targeting the upper eyelids, the lower eyelids, the bags, um, crow's feet, et cetera, you know, some of those um, signs of aging. Now, areas that tend to, yes. Uh, just sticking with eyes, I remember uh, in yoga, like 45 years ago when I was in Hawaii and taking yoga classes, and I, I don't know if we're, we consider this, these, uh, facial exercises or not, but it would be this, you know, wide eyed and looking up and looking sideways and circling the eyeball around. Are those versions of facial exercises? So that's a, that's a great question. So what, you know, moving the eyeballs around, there are muscles within the eyeball. So there are extraocular muscles and those muscles are responsible for moving the eyeballs around. So those muscles are good to strengthen as well, but I'm specifically targeting, um, muscles where I understand where the origin and the insertion are and working those muscles, even working muscles that are attached to the upper eyelids and working the muscles along the forehead that actually end up 
you know, over time, the forehead muscles start to attenuate, they get longer because of gravity, and they start to push down. And then you get, you know, the eyelids that start to droop and, and so forth. So um, I get the question a lot about, oh, I've heard of face yoga versus, you know, some of the other things. So I, the, the exercises that I developed, the ex, the, the research that I have done and the evidence-based sort of scientific um, evidence that's out there is based on uh, studies and work by um, oral and facial maxillary surgeons, uh, dentists, uh, speech pathologists. So a lot of the work that um, I've incorporated into what I do is understanding from a pure uh, facial anatomy, physiology of the muscles, the biomechanics of the muscles, um, and then creating exercises that stick with those um, anatomy and physiology principles. Could you give us an example of like one exercise for the eye? And could you also, this is a two-pronged question. You can answer whichever one you want first. Um, I um, had heard that you can use your fingers as dumbbells and then if you put them on your eyelid and then gently with not much pressure but use your eyelid to open and close using the extra little extra weight from your fingers that that could be an, a, an exercise to open up your eyes true or false <laughs> so i i i don't use um i well I'll, I'll tell you what's true you can use your fingers, your hands, um, as uh, resistance, sort of in a, in a weight bearing perspective. So when you say sort of the dumbbells, you know, you're increasing the weight of dumbbells because you want to increase the resistance. So I do use the fingers to create resistance. Um, however, you know, the exercise that you just showed me is, is not is not an exercise that um, I use to lift the eyelids. So I have about, there's probably about six or seven different variations of an eye exercise, but the one that I, uh, that I usually start with, uh, with individuals is, um, helping them isolate the eyes from the eye muscles from the other muscles surrounding the face, because one of the key things to, uh, exercising the face is first you have to, you have to identify the muscle. You have to feel that muscle. The second thing is isolating the muscle from the other muscles surrounding the, um, the muscles that you're targeting. And then third, being able to um, move them in a way that creates a uh, tone in that muscle. So those are the three steps um, that I use to, to help individuals understand how to move those, those uh, facial muscles. Because the muscles in the face are different than the muscles in the rest of the body because one, they are flat. So they, they lie flat on the face versus let's say, you know, you look at your biceps, right? And your biceps, you know, your tri your triceps, your all of your leg muscles, they're all in what they call fascicles. So they're in bundles. All of the fibers are in a bundle. And so the reason why exercising the face is different than exercising the rest of the body is that you can do push-ups or you can take the dumbbell and do your bicep curls. You don't really have to think much about it. You can just sort of do, you know, just count and you can kind of zone out a little bit. But when you exercise the face muscles, they are the only muscles in the body that are intricately linked to the brain. So for example, if you, if I say, Kathy, you look gorgeous in that dress. You just responded with a smile and you didn't have to think about it. So that's one pathway that the brain activates the facial muscles is just an involuntary pathway, automatic. You didn't have to think, okay, Naima just said, I look very beautiful in my dress, now let me smile. The other pathway, which is usually less developed in humans is just exercising muscles independent of one another. And so that's where you've got to build and strengthen the neural pathways between the brain and the facial muscles so that you can, one, your brain can identify this is the muscle I'm using, and then I'm going to move this muscle independent of all of the other muscles. And so I'll give you an example of how, how difficult that can be when you first start off, which is one of the reasons why um, what my first program starts at six weeks, because evidence, um, neuroscience, 
basically states that it takes about six weeks to build um, habits to form new neural pathways. And so at a minimum, it will take about six weeks to be able to move some of the more complex muscles like the muscles in the cheeks. So for example, um, what I would start with in terms of exercising the eyes is I would say, I would love for you, Kathy, to open your eyes as wide as you can. Great, so relax. One of the things that I noticed, I'm not sure if you did, was did you move your eyebrows up? Did you move your forehead at all? Forehead. I, I noticed forehead. Yes. I noticed exactly. forehead. That's why I well, I went, I started with eyes. Yeah. I wanted to make it bigger and bigger and to impress you with how big I could get. Um, <laughs> exactly. I, I started to lift my forehead. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So I would say that's great that you've um you've identified and felt, you know, the muscles moving, but I just want you to move the eye muscles without the forehead muscles. So it would look something like this. <laughs> wow, that was big. <laughs> that exactly. was impressive. Exactly. And so what you're saying is, because your eyes, uh, and for the listeners, some people are watching and some people are listening, but for the listeners, basically, Naima just, her eyes like, look <laughs> almost like tripled in size, almost. They got very, 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 very big. You can see the white all around. And, right. And that's something that with practice, you're saying, so if the first time we do it, you're just getting a little bit of motion, then it's, right. then it's that practicing Right. Just as you mentioned in fitness, it's it's not the one time with the bicep curl that makes the difference. Exactly. It's the consistency of it. Exactly. And so, and it's opening the eyes without moving the forehead. Because if you want to really work on the eye muscles, you've got to just move the eye muscles. You cannot move the forehead muscles because you won't see the results. So it's just like I can um you know, if I wanted to work on my quads, I can do squats. But if I'm also, you know, moving other muscles and getting in the way, the squats are not going to just, you know, the quads are not just going to get um, all of that exercise. And because the muscles in the face are so thin and very delicate, it takes all of work in that muscle and those fibers together to actually create the results. And that takes time. It takes time to be able to move the eyes without moving the forehead, without moving the cheek muscles. And then over time, you get to then just focus on moving the eye muscles and then really working those muscles to for results. Um, and so that's, that was the first step. That's the first step. So we started, we started eyes. And I think you mentioned mouth was the other area that has this uh, circular or ring-like muscle. Yes, yes. And um, was there a specific question about that? Or well, it's just, is it so, and I would imagine, because I, I would say that if we polled people, and I'm sure you know better than I with this, but just polling my friends and, um, you know, it's usually eyes, it's usually around the mouth and then it's you know and then it's uh cheekbones and then yeah. and well and then it goes jawline and neck so you yeah. know there's there's uh and i'm sure everybody's got a little their own little pet peeve about their face yeah. um, the jowls is really big for um you know and i go back to the question where you said what what areas are easier to work than others the areas that are easier to work are the eyes and the lips the more complex areas um it are the cheeks the jowl area, the jawline, and the neck. Why? Because there are more muscles involved in those areas. Uh, two, those areas tend to, especially the jowls area, um, you can't get Botox in the jowl area. You have to just get the surgery. So that's where I work with um with individuals to help them identify those muscles and, and work those muscles out. The jawline area, the reason why that is also very complicated uh, or more complex is that you have the neck muscles here. So the neck muscles, um, especially the platissima muscle that originates right below 
the collarbone and it reaches up and it grabs all along the jawline on top of the muscles that are already in that area. So you've got to work the muscles of the neck and the muscles around the jawline. So it's sort of, you sort of have a double, a double whammy when you're talking about that area. And that's why that area usually takes um, a little bit longer. Um, and it also is a bit more complex in terms of trying to understand and feel those muscles as well. The cheek area, you've got a lot of volume that you lose over time because of the fat. Over time, the fat volume just decreases. And so you're left with a lot of just skin and, and muscle. And so working all of those muscles um, tends to be um, a bit more challenging. But that's the beauty of I say face exercise, because one, you cannot divorce the mind from, the, from working out your face. You have to concentrate. It is an exercise routine that requires you mostly to do it in the mirror so that you can actually become acquainted with the muscles, see how the muscles move independent of one another, and then actually watch your, the muscles start to increase in size and therefore fill out the volume that was lost because of the fat. Makes perfect sense. Um, I do think that um, it is almost like a mindfulness exercise. I can imagine, uh, and what I want to get into is how much time do you recommend doing something like this or how long is one of your sessions when you work with somebody, but in general, when working on your own, how, how much time per day? But I can also imagine that it is um, it, that five, 10 minutes, whatever it is per day, is, uh, is completely getting into your breath and this my, muscle isolation, which I, I love doing in my body. I love trying to isolate muscles. Uh, I like compound exercises. I like functional exercises where things work together. And then I like to find and just isolate a glute or a part of the hamstring. And I find both are very beneficial, but it takes a lot of focus to do that. And I, it really calms me down because there can't be a lot of extraneous thoughts going on when you're trying to do those isolations. And I would imagine the same thing happens with facial fitness. It does. It's um, you described it accurately. You um, what most people um, realize is that it does take a lot of focus and concentration. And sometimes I will have my clients just close their eyes and visualize the muscle and then move the muscle. And once they eliminate that sort of visual distractions, they're able to move the muscles and gain more control over it. And it's, you know, it's, it's amazing. Um, and it does take less than 10 minutes a day. So my, uh, base, um, routine that I usually, uh, prescribe to my clients is two times a day. Some very ambitious clients who want to see results much, much sooner, they will, they will um, exercise anywhere between three and five times a day. And if you think about it, if it's less than 10 minutes a day, it's really not that much of your time. Um, and it does require that mindfulness. You have to really think about the muscles that you're moving. It cannot be a check the box. Okay, I did my exercises, one, two, three, and now I'm off to doing something else. You really have to be in the moment when you're exercising your face. Because as I mentioned, the muscles are flat. They're organized in a very parallel fashion. So this fi muscle fiber here is not attached to this muscle fiber. It's one, two, three, four, five versus the, um, the, the, the cylindrical where they're all together. When they're all together in that, in that big bundle, they're all touching one another. And so they, that's where they can get that power and move very quickly. But with the facial muscles, they're organized in that very, you know, single file. And so you have to, you have to wait and go slow so that you're being very deliberate when you're moving those muscles. Um, and so it is a very um, intimate practice because it's you looking at yourself in the, in the mirror and really just becoming so intimately acquainted with your face and really understanding how to move those facial muscles um, independent of one another so you actually can see results. Could I take a moment right now before we jump into facial expressions and how our daily facial expressions uh, impact 
the aging process and how we look. But before we jump into that, you wrote something in one of your blogs and I want to, I want to um, read it because I, what I love about your approach is it's balanced. I think that we can all become very fixated on this aging process. And um, <laughs> I wrote an article once, not aging gracefully, but aging disgracefully, because <laughs> there, there's something about being a badass and a, you know, a, a person that's uh, living their life to the fullest and uh, stepping into their power. And to this other side of taking care of ourselves. The same thing is true with our body. You know, you yeah. walk the line, you wanna be healthy, you wanna be ready for all the adventures in your 40s, 50s, 60s and beyond, you wanna be strong. But the fixation of, uh, with, uh, you know, weight or whatever can also um, detract from your lifestyle, detract from your well being. You, you wrote something again in your blog, and I'm just gonna read it. It says a key component to understanding how to age gracefully is that true beauty is expressed from the inside out. True inner beauty is neither vain, false, or superficial and cannot be measured by chronological age. It is ageless, fearless, and lives life without the fear of getting old. It is mature, authentic, self-accepting, and exists as your true self-expressed, as your true self expressed outwardly. So, I love that quote, and I love the fact that you do, you seem to be, um, not seem, you are, in all the blogs and everything that I've read that you've done, you're really about this balancing of, let's take care of ourselves, let's not get overly fixated, let's uh, manage our expectations, and let's also live life to the fullest. Yeah, so I think, um... You know, I, I personally, I mean, I'll be 52 this year. And so I have come to that realization that there, there are sort of two forces out there um, in, in the public. There's this uh, obsession with youth. And then there's this sort of quiet um, movement of accepting where you are, but trying to figure out what's the, what's the optimal way to, to get there, to love yourself, to um, embrace every season that you're in and living that to the fullest without getting caught up in this you know, youth obsessed movement. And so I have seen many women, friends of mine, acquaintance, acquaintances who have gotten caught up in that movement. And that drives them to make decisions that are not optimal for their lives. And so I, on the other hand, have you know, looked at you know, whether it was my grandmother or whether it was some of the women that you've, um, you quoted earlier, um, who decided, you know what, I love who I am. Aging is a process. It's just like wine. It gets better with time. And therefore, I want to be able to get better with time. And so what does that look like? And so uh, I've had to navigate it for myself and then also help navigate it for the women that I work with, because what does that really look like? And to everyone, it's it's very different. But at, at the core of it, it's being healthy, healthy mindset, healthy attitude towards aging, and doing everything that you can within your control to age naturally and gracefully. We've all seen the 80 or 90 year old that looks as young as the girl, just there's this youthfulness about her that just emanates from the inside out. And you want, and that's the spirit that you want to capture because a lot of that, what's inside, when it's beautiful and it's accepting of yourself, it does become expressed and you inevitably will look younger without doing anything. So there's that part of ourselves that is powerful beyond measure. And then there's the outer part. You wanna take care of your skin. You want to take care of every single muscle in your body, not just the muscles below the neck. And so it's simply realizing, oh, I've got some more muscles that I need to work out. I can do that as well. Because when I have really put together the whole aging process and what really causes premature facial aging, a lot of it is the, the facial expressions. And that we'll talk about because that comes from the inside. And 
just doing the work on the muscles to counteract the gravity because gravity is pulling down on every single muscle. And then once you do the exercises for the face that counteract the gravity, you see such a difference. I mean, I cannot tell you how many women in their 50s, 60s, 70s have said like, I'm aging backwards. I did not think it was possible. I thought I had to go that other route. But when you work on yourself, as opposed to someone working on you, the Botox, the fillers, and the cosmetic surgery. When you work on yourself, when you do the work, facial exercises is you doing the work. You become acquainted acquainted with your face. Um, there's a beauty that comes and an acceptance that comes out of that work that you do for yourself that you cannot capture in any other in any other way. Love that, and uh, I think. The way that you presented it today, but also on in your blogs, websites, interviews, uh, I think it is exactly uh, on point with uh, how I feel about this journey. Um, so let's let's switch gears to facial expressions, and uh, we know the obvious ones like you know squinting, uh, grimacing, uh, maybe anger furrowing the butt brow. I know when my daughters were growing up and they'd be out in the sun and then they would furrow here. I'd, be, I'd go, oh, just, you know, watch that. <laughs> you know, exactly. or, watch that. Or you might be, you know, uh, you know, having um, some issues. And I, I, and I actually going back to, I used to shoot outdoors. I did a TV show in the eighties called Alive and Well. And um, I have to say that I would, get in the show and there it was shot i'm just going to move a little closer here i want to make sure that the um sound is being picked up sorry about that uh do you want to make sure the microphone's picking up the sound accurately um so anyway i would go we would shoot outside we shot in the marina in los angeles and there would be the sun and then if you don't have sun you outdoors they have these big lights in your face and yeah. it would just be this test you know this this struggle for me to not just frown and furrow because I have very sensitive, I have light eyes my entire life. They're very sensitive. And I think it's one of the things through my life. I've always worn hats and I've always worn sunglasses when I'm outside because my eyes just can't take all of that light. And I end up squinting and furrowing and mainly not even for the facial expressions. It's just uncomfortable, but I would imagine those are kind of the basics that uh, people know about. What are some of the things we do with our face that we might not be thinking about um, and if we are doing it and it's habitual, how do we break those habits? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and it's a key part of my program is addressing uh, the facial expressions that we have that actually age you. So regardless of what the sun is doing and anything else, just those expressions alone, even if you have a young person make those expressions, they look beyond their years. So um, typical expressions would just be... Um, if someone is talking to you about something and you want to you want to express your interest, you want to express how uh, engaged you are. There's that sort of you know listening and looking, and then you're you're doing this. You are you know wrinkling the forehead, and this is literally unnecessary because you can. And what I teach is how do you how to show interest without making that expression, and that expression is not. Uh, normal. It's actually learned behavior because we've seen other people do it, whether it was in our own family or what have you, but you can just move, you can just open your eyes wider to show interest. Wow. That's so amazing versus wow. That's so amazing. You know, there's two different ways that you can express those types of um, emotions with, and save your face in the process. So I rarely move my forehead. People, some people say you must have Botox in your forehead because you're not moving your forehead. I'm like, no, I don't because you can see I can move it. I just choose to use other muscles that, you know, using my eyes, making my eyes wider. That actually is showing the expression that I want. And it's also working. I'm also working my eyes out because I'm using those eye muscles to open and open and open. So that's a form of exercise as, a, as, as well as um, showing interest. Um, there's the phone uh, look where we get our cell phones and we just are like, you know, constantly. And so the neck starts to push forward 
and the forehead and everything starts, you start to look so much older beyond your years. I had a client, she was in her forties and we started working together. I had her turn to the side on Zoom and I took some photos of her on Zoom and then I shared the screen and I said, let's look at how you look. And she said, wow, I look so old because literally she was sort of hunched over like an old woman. Then I had her sit up straight, move her neck back. She said it felt very, very strange. I said, but it looks, it looks very natural and normal. I took some more pictures, showed her on Zoom and literally she looked so, so much younger. The years just fell off. So I do a lot of, um, I, I, I practice ballet. Ballet has a lot to do with posture. And so I gave her some posture exercises to strengthen her back and to help her be mindful. If you need to uh, read something, why not bring it to your, you know, bring the phone here or the newspaper. We've all seen, you know, our, our fathers and grandfathers and men on the trains when they're reading, they're not reading like this. They're usually reading the paper like this. And so it's literally saving those back muscles and keeping that posture right way. Because the more, the, the, the head is very heavy. So the more you move your head forward off of the, the spinal column, the more you're going to end up with that sort of old hunchback look. So that's, uh, yeah, that's so something. one thing I want to just um, interject here um, for people that couldn't see what Naima was doing is that the, the gentleman on the, the um, gentleman on the train, instead of holding it down, whether it's your tablet or your iPhone or the paper, it's holding it more at eye level. And I understand, and we talk posture a lot, so I understand posture. What I didn't understand, and maybe you could clarify, is what does that have to do with our faces, uh, you know, our face and neck at this point? Because posture is rules. I totally understand that. And, it's, yep. and that banana shape doesn't um, uh, make you look younger, it makes you look older. But what does that impact does that have on our face or neck? So the neck, it has a, a big impact on the neck because then the neck, it, all of those muscles are not being used to, to hold the head straight up. And so the neck then takes on a different posture and then the skin starts to sag in a very different way. So what you're doing is here and in an upright posture, my skin is a fixed straight. But as I start to move it forward, that makes, you can see the skin starts to have more of an impact um, or gravity starts to have more of an impact on the skin on the neck. So that's one thing. Also just the, um, you're thinking about something, you're not happy about it. You keep that sort of scowl look on your face and then you go off to do something else. That scowl look is still there because you're not aware of your facial expressions in, in space and time. And what I, it's, it's, a, it's a mind face connection that I helped to restore because, you know, we all talk about the mind body connection and let's connect the mind and the body, but we don't talk about what is the mind face connection. And the mind face connection is way more stronger than the mind body because those those nerves are innervating coming right off the brain and the spinal column and innervating the facial muscles very quickly. And, and, and so therefore you want to make sure that you are mindful of your facial muscles, um, at every, you know, at, at every moment. And so that's really, um, helping to, to rebuild that. So when we see someone who looks angry or looks upset and we ask them, Oh, you look upset. Is everything okay? And they say, Oh, I'm fine. Everything's great. They don't look like that everything is great. It's because they've lost that connection between their facial muscles and what they're really thinking and, and feeling inside. So it's bringing a greater awareness to that. And it's created that groove. So we've grooved that in. And if you are constantly, let's use exaggerate, like in a state of anger and you, or you get angry and you've started to groove those facial expressions in, then that creates... Um, tension in those muscles. And I would imagine, you know, more lines, more wrinkles, more um, whatever. What's the saying, what's the saying you, um, it's about your face, you grow into your face. Uh, you know, the, a positive person who's smiling all the time has pretty good thoughts, has a pretty good handle on their stress. There's a way that they uh, will age as opposed to somebody who's yeah. 
bitter, cantankerous, angry, Absolutely. and Absolutely. that also gets, um, as you know, as I said, it just there's a groove as if you're playing yeah. a phonograph or something, and those grooves get deeper and deeper and deeper, and they also all of a sudden just um, will mold you into uh, you know the outside that looks more that that is actually more reflective of the inside so anyway could be true maybe not it is very then... it is very true it is absolutely very true um because the facial expression that you know we're talking about over time that's what gets etched into your face and then you take on that persona even if you change how you're feeling inside what is it appearing on the face is actually has not changed because that connection has just been lost. And so what I, what I do is try to help one build that connection back and then release the tension in those muscles so that we can reverse the direction that they were going. So all of the, the lines that are created, we get to smooth those out so that you know, we can work on the appearance of looking younger. And a lot of it is just reversing a lot of those, um, those premature, I say premature signs of aging because they are not because of the aging process. They're because of the habits that we've formed over time. Well, I, uh, we could talk forever about muscles and, and um, facial expressions, but I really find um, the work you're doing just so helpful and it's it's new and people don't understand it and a lot of people think it's gimmicky or i'm too old to be trying something like this i'm i'm um i i don't have the patience for it perhaps but i'm also past the point where it would do any good is there a, is are there candidates better candidates than others for this type of um facial work I would say there's no age limit um, because I have I have um, clients into their 70s, mid 70s, late 70s, and they they actually see results much faster than my clients in their 40s. Um, so that you know if that says anything. Um, the age is is it's you would never not start working out if you were 70. You know your body it's the same thing. You wouldn't work, stop, you know, not want to work out your face. But the, I would say the best candidates for a program like mine are individuals, one, who have a healthy self-esteem, who understand that um, exercising is a journey. And it is uh, something that you embrace and you see the results over time. Two, uh, individuals who want to maintain a youthful appearance, not looking like they're 20, but a youthful appearance. And a youthful appearance really is just a skin that's uh, healthy, facial muscles that are toned, and facial expressions that reflect positive outlook in life. That's a youthful appearance. Um, just because you have a wrinkle or two doesn't mean you don't have a youthful appearance. So it's really, to me, understanding what a youthful appearance means. It really, you know, I think individuals need to understand what that definition means because it doesn't mean um, looking like you're 20. And that's where I think a lot of individuals feel like um, if I don't achieve that, that sort of plastic look, then I, I'm not gonna look young. And that's just simply not true. The other uh, I would say is people who have um, discipline, people who have really good habits um, and want to learn more about themselves because you inevitably will learn so much more about yourself. It sounds like it. I've learned more about myself just in this interview. So I appreciate that. Um, let's just wrap up. I know you're really busy. I appreciate the time that you've given us already, but I'd like to just, mention um skincare i know you have your own skincare line but could, before we talk about your skincare line or i'll refer people to your skincare line can we can you just give me your top four of what people are doing at home uh, a woman who's 45 or older at home or it could be any woman but let's just say more mature skin what would be a four step process for those of us who don't like a lot of steps, what's the four-step process that you would do 
uh, through the day, I'm sure one of them or, th or through the week, I'm sure one of them is going to be exfoliating because that's uh, we hear a lot about that. But uh, could you just give us maybe a four step weekly process that you would recommend? Sure. So I would um, I would start with a really good cleanser because you want to keep your pores really clear. Um, so that is essential. And sometimes you may want to do a double cleanse. And a double cleanse is just where you have, uh, where you're taking off your makeup with um, a cleansing oil, and then you're cleansing your face afterwards. And that's especially in the evening. Um, the second I would say is having product, and it could be a serum, um, that has really high levels of antioxidants. Um, antioxidants are so important because one, they protect our skin from free radical damage. And that free, those free radicals can um, come from whether it's sun induced or it could be the pollution outside. Um, so just not only having a serum that has high level of antioxidants, but also just making sure you have that in your diet as well. Um, I would say having a really good moisturizer, a moisturizer that contains lots of lipids um, to help with the moisture balance. Um, and then I would do um, exfoliation. So in terms of, you don't necessarily have to exfoliate every day, but there would be, and since you only gave me four steps, I'm just sort of throwing in that exfoliation. <laughs> Um, but you want to make sure that as, because as you get older, you, your skin doesn't turn over as quickly. And so what you want to do is help accelerate that process so that you're revealing fresh, uh, skin cells. And so exfoliation is very, very key, whether you're doing an exfoliating mask a few times a week, or um, I use an exfoliating cleanser um, that's very gentle and mild, but it helps to, it helps my skin to stay in that constant um, state of, you know, wanting to turn over. And so you're revealing that fresh, uh, hydrated, smooth skin. So exfoliate, but don't over exfoliate sounds yeah. like. And um, since we're talking about skincare and products, let's switch over for just a second. That's tools. I, I've been doing a lot of reading about uh, oh, different tools. And let's just see. Um, they are for, there's one called Gua Sha Tool, which helps drain excess fluid. There's beauty rollers, there's microcurrent tools that give little pinch and little shocks to the face. Anything, any of these tools worth purchasing or, uh, or, is it, or do you think that we can do most of what you're describing today through our own you know, using our own fingers and our own body and our own uh, awareness to tone our facial muscles. Yeah, so uh, I'm a fan of tools, um, especially, well, the, the tools that are manual. So like you mentioned, the gua sha. Um, I love the gua sha. I recommend using it, um, especially uh, around the jawline because you, you want to move a lot of that excess fluids in the tissue. Um, and it just feels really good. And also just using it along the contours um, as well as, you know, around um, the forehead as well. So those are great. I use it in the evening when I'm doing my evening ritual so that um, it just sort of seals everything in. The, the um, you didn't can mention. You explain, can you explain it to our listener if they don't know what a gua sha tool is? So a gua sha tool is um, it's made from jade stone and it has um, it's sort of like the shape of a heart, but it, it actually they come in a lot of different shapes. I use a particular shape that just has a heart shape and it's a little kind of um, a tail towards the end and it fits very nicely along the jawline. So you can actually start in the center of the chin and just move it along the jawline in either direction and then bring it down along the neck. It feels amazing. Um, also, you can start near the corner of the, the nose where your nostrils are and then just move it out um, across your um, 
your cheeks. And so that um, towards the ears. And so that is also amazing. Um, it's great. Um, I have, I use that to help with wrinkles across horizontal wrinkles across the forehead. So helping to smooth the wrinkles out as well. Um, the jade roller is also another tool that I use. Um, it has a roller on each end. It's also made from jade stone. And um, there's a, there's a smaller roller on one end and a larger roller on the um, other end. And so just rolling, it's a great tool to use at the end of the day. And for the individuals that I work with who were trying to work on facial expressions and relaxing and releasing the tension, I recommend using that as well, especially in the evening before the end of the day, before the day is over, just, you know, rolling out those muscles. I also, for many of my clients, when they work out their face, it's a great tool to use when their muscles feel a little fatigued in the face, because eventually they do just like any other muscle in the body when you're working them out you're going to feel like whoa my and I, I kind of describe the the feeling as like if when you were a kid and you laugh so hard you said oh my face hurts I laugh so hard it's the same feeling it's like wow I just felt like I worked my face muscles so I'll have them use the jade roller to relax the muscles um, as well as help relieve the tension uh, I also do um use light therapy, so LED light therapy, which uses different wavelengths. So I use um, that in my practice to help stimulate um, a lot of the cells in the face that help to reverse the signs of um, premature aging, like sagging skin and wrinkles as well. That was so much fun. It was such a pleasure having her on the show today. Naima is really quite incredible. It was such a pleasure meeting her and talking with her. So what I learned and my big takeaway is when it comes to your body and your face, having muscle is all about the qualities that we equate with youth. I appreciate that Naima encourages aspirational, yet really realistic expectations on looking younger, while also emphasizing the inner self, which is just that approach. I really admire her for the way she's doing this. So as you begin to shed some of the beauty stereotypes and embrace the beauty of your current season, wherever you are in your life, um, and understanding your face, your skin, you're going to develop a deeper compassion for your body. And really, I guess, what can I say? Love the face that's smiling back at you in the mirror, because that feels good when on a daily basis, we can just embrace who we are and um and just keep moving forward and doing the good things for our health for our uh for our skin our muscles but at the same time doing good in the world and just finding out where where is that special place in our lives right now where is that passion that we have that we can focus our energy and just making this world a better place so in doing that i see um uh, Naima is doing that because she has found her passion and she has her fitness program and it's called Naima's Face Enhancing Program. It's a holistic and guided approach that addresses your facial expressions, your contour changes and skin health. Everything we talked about on the show today. Plus her skin care products are made uh, from all potent organic plant extracts and botanicals packed with antioxidants and made with, uh, without anything harmful or artificial. One thing that I talked about with Naima after the show ended is that she's a cancer survivor. So it became very, very important for her to develop products that were not only going to help your skin, but were also going to be good for you and not cause any toxicities. Uh, you can find all of this information at her website. I'm going to spell it. It's Balance, B E L L A. A oh, I'm gonna start over. B E L L A N T Z dot com. Think Bella N T Z. And um, that's very exciting. I got some exciting news. Okay, you ready for this one? This was a huge milestone for for all of us over at Kathy Smith Lifestyles. This is our hundredth episode. And it's all, uh, so much of this has to do with you guys. This journey, we've taken this journey together. You've been with me uh, through the different episodes. 
And it's all your motivation and kind words that have just kept this going for me and kept me motivated and kept me wanting to do more shows. And there's many, many, many more to come. So if you have any ideas, send them my way because I'm always looking for unique angles on what we can cover on the show. Now, to celebrate the milestone, um, I'm going to give an ask right now. <laughs> leave If you could leave me a review on Apple Podcasts, that would be great because you know, our reviews really are our lifeline for people like myself who make podcasts. Uh, we kind of rely on you guys putting in a good word for us to keep the momentum going. So anything you can do, greatly appreciate it. Now, you can always check out the archives um, if you're looking for more episodes. So let me give you some of the newer ones. I'm going to rattle these off a little bit. If you're interested in explosive exercise movements that can elicit um different responses in your body and support successful aging. Remember, type two muscles start to, we start to lose those earlier and we lose those, those explosive muscles. You might wanna check out the conversation with Pete McCall, that's episode, episode 99. Or you can adjust a keto diet to the female body and specifically how to tailor the diet for your own body type. If you wanna to listen to Dr. Sarah Gottfried, that was episode number 98. Um, or you might want to jump in and listen to Dr. David Perlmutter. David was the one that wrote, wrote The Grain Brain. His, his new book is called Drop Acid, and it's about your uric acid levels and how might they might be playing with your metabolic health. So with that in mind, lots to cover, lots more to come. Love you guys. Until next time, to your health. Have a good one.